So this video explains how to calculate the various portfolio evaluation measures that we've looked at in class. So what I've got on the screen here is the price index and market index that we've been looking at in earlier videos, their equivalent return series, the monthly risk-free rate of return, and the excess return on both the market, uh, the risky portfolio and the market portfolio that we've also calculated earlier. And over here are the statistics from those earlier videos. So I've just got the average returns across each, my measures of risk, my measures of downside risk. And in this box below, I'm now going to calculate the portfolio evaluation measures. So before I go into jumping in and calculating them, let's just quickly remind ourselves how we actually go about calculating each of these measures. So first of all, we've got the Sharpe ratio. And the Sharpe ratio is calculated as the excess return of the portfolio divided by the standard deviation of the portfolio. That way what it's looking at is the reward versus the risk of investment, that trade-off between reward and risk. The next one is the M squared measure. Now what you might recall from class is what we do with the M squared measure is we construct a hypothetical portfolio that has the same risk as the market. And the way that we do that is by combining our risky portfolio and the risk-free rate of return such that we equate the standard deviation of returns. So the way we can actually equate the standard deviation of returns is weighting our risky portfolio in the ratio of standard deviation of the market to the standard deviation of that risky portfolio. And we obviously then weight the risk-free rate as the inverse of that, or the uh, one minus the, that particular ratio. Once we've got the weightings for each of these uh, assets, the risky portfolio and the risk-free asset that is equated to our uh, standard deviation of the market, we calculate the return of that hypothetical portfolio and compare it to the return of the market. So this is implicitly the weight that we're going to invest in the risky portfolio times the return of that portfolio, plus this is in parentheses here, the weight that we're going to be investing in the risk-free rate times the return on the risk-free rate. So in square brackets, we have the return on this hypothetical portfolio that has the same standard deviation of the market. And what we implicitly do is look, we compare that return to the market return. So we subtract the market return off. The M squared measure gives us our premium, our magnitude of our returns either above or below the market return that is generated by this risk equivalent portfolio. Now what we know in terms of both Sharpe ratio and M squared measure is they use standard deviation as a measure of risk. Next is our train all ratio, that's just excess return of the portfolio as the numerator, and instead of dividing by standard deviation, which we do in the Sharpe ratio, we divide that by the beta of the portfolio. Our alpha, alpha is the difference between the actual return on the portfolio, RP, and the theoretical return that we expect to generate based on the cap M. So what we actually do is say alpha is the return on the portfolio minus the expected return as per the cap M, which is risk-free rate plus beta times excess return on the market. And we calculate this and we get an alpha. Now, the good thing about the alpha, like the M squared measure, is that it gives us a measure of the magnitude of over or under performance, whereas both the Sharpe ratio and the trade or measure can only be used to compare portfolios. It doesn't tell us magnitude or over or under performance. Next two measures of risk use downside risk. Uh, as the, the risk measure. So the first is the Sortino ratio. The numerator, again, is excess return on the risky portfolio, but now we divide by that downside deviation or downside standard deviation of returns, which is the standard deviation of all returns that are less than the mean. And RAYROC, or risk adjusted return on capital. So in this one, again, the numerator is the excess return of the portfolio. The denominator is the difference between the return on the portfolio and that 5% VAR, which is the fifth percentile of historical returns. So the difference between the mean return and that 5% VAR is another way to measure downside risk because it's giving us a measure of the distance between that, that midpoint, the average, and the, the fifth percentile of returns. And last of all, our information ratio, which we use to calculate uh, the performance of an active investor, is Jensen's alpha, the alpha from up here earlier, divided by our measure of unsystematic risk. And you'll recall from an earlier video, we measure unsystematic risk as the standard deviation of the residuals from our CAPM regression. So jumping back into my spreadsheet, if I want to calculate the Sharpe ratio of my portfolio, I can calculate that as excess return, so return minus risk-free rate. And sorry, I should just retitle this one is actually risk-free rate. So return minus risk-free rate 
divided by the standard deviation of those returns. Okay, I've got a sharp ratio of 0.125 using the formula here. And I can do the same for the market. So return minus risk-free rate oops, divided by standard deviation of the market. Again, the, the benefit of the Sharpe ratio is that it can be used to compare and we can see our portfolio has a higher Sharpe ratio than the market, so we've outperformed the market. The M squared measure, so I'm going to calculate this hypothetical portfolio. Now, I can do it in one step here uh, with my long formula, or I can do some workings over to the side, which may be a little bit more intuitive. So what I want to calculate is what's going to be the weight of my risky portfolio and what's going to be the rate of the weight of my risk-free weight rate risk-free return. So remembering again, I weight my risky portfolio as the ratio of the standard deviation of the market to the standard deviation of that risky portfolio. And one minus that value is the weighting in the risk-free rate. So let's think why intuitively this makes sense. What we're trying to do is calculate a hypothetical portfolio that uses my risky portfolio but combines it with the risk-free rate such that the level of risk is equivalent to the market. So if we compare standard deviation here, we can see that my risky portfolio actually has a higher standard deviation than the market. So in order to equate that level of risk, what I would have to do is invest less than 100% in the risky portfolio and also invest some in the risk-free rate. That's exactly what you can see here. So we've said that if I'm investing 77% in my risky portfolio and the balance about 23% in the risk-free rate, then that combination would result in a portfolio that has a standard deviation of 0.0443. So to calculate my M squared measure then, all I'm doing is calculating the return on this new hypothetical portfolio less the return on the market. So return is the weight invested in the risky portfolio times return of the risky portfolio plus the weight in the risk-free rate of return multiplied by that risk-free rate Multiple, uh, subtracted return on the market. So M squared is a positive, that means that this portfolio has outperformed the market and 0.0005 means the magnitude by which it's outperformed the market is 0.05%. So it's given me not only direction, so positive means outperformed, negative means un underperformed, it's given me the magnitude by which I actually have outperformed in this case. Train or measure, next of all. Train or measure is simply just the excess return of the stock divided by the beta of the stock. Okay, so again, that value itself uh, is meaningless, but when it gets meaning is where we compare it to train or measure for the market. And the trade or measure for the market is always just the excess return of the market. Why is that? Because we know the beta of the market is one. So when I calculate return minus risk-free rate, Dividing by beta, I'm always just dividing by one. Okay, once again here we can see based on trade or measure, my portfolio has outperformed the market. So Jensen's Alpha next of all. Jensen's Alpha is calculated as the return on my risky portfolio less the expected return as per the CAPM. So minus, and the CAPM theoretical return is risk-free rate plus beta times return on the market less the risk-free rate. Okay, so we can see here, this part of the formula, this is just my CAPM, risk-free rate plus beta times return on the market less risk-free rate. So that part that I've highlighted here, that is my expected return, or the return I theoretically expect to generate given the beta of this stock. In cell M3, I've got the return I actually generated. So when I compare those two, I can see I've got a positive alpha, again, that means outperformance, and I can get a measure of the magnitude of outperformance in this particular case, which is 0.13%. Okay. The Jensen's alpha of the market will always be zero. So I'm basically comparing this to zero, just like the M squared measure, which I'm also comparing to zero. Information ratio then is calculated as the ratio of that Jensen's alpha from above divided by my measure of unsystematic risk, which was the standard deviation of the residuals from earlier. In this particular case, my information ratio value is 0.0545. Again, that value only has meaning in terms of being able to uh, compare active portfolio managers against each other. Although what we'll, we'll note is that uh, a positive information ratio will mean outperformance and a negative information ratio will mean underperformance. The reason for that is because the numerator is our alpha, 
and we know a positive alpha means outperformance and a negative alpha means underperformance. And we're dividing that by our unsystematic risk, which is a positive definite value. Always must be positive, so because we're always dividing by a positive number, the sign of the information ratio will be determined by the sign of the alpha value. So a TNO ratio, next of all, that's a measure of excess return of our portfolio as the numerator. But in this case, we're dividing that by downside deviation. Okay, and like the Sharpe ratio, it only has meaning when we compare it to some benchmark. So what I'm going to do is calculate the Sortino ratio for the market as well. Based on the Sortino ratio, we can see that our, our risky portfolio has outperformed. And last of all, the risk adjusted return on capital. So risk adjusted return on capital, our numerator is return minus the risk free rate. And our denominator is our mean return minus our VAR, our 5% VAR or our 5th percentile of historical returns. Okay, close the brackets there and I get the risk adjusted return on capital. Okay, I can compare that to my market again. So excess return on the market as the numerator. Be careful with your parentheses. So uh, because Excel will automatically follow order of operations, if I didn't put brackets around this, it won't treat all this as the one numerator. So definitely be careful with use of brackets. And the denominator is return minus the VAR. Okay, and my risky portfolio has also outperformed uh, according to my risk adjusted return on capital. So we've now calculated portfolio evaluation measures uh, across each of these different uh, types. And what the last thing we need to consider is, well, which of these particular measures is most important? And the answer is it depends upon the particular situation. So what we've got to think about is the type of risk that's being used in each of these portfolio evaluation measures. So first of all, Sharpe ratio and M squared, they both measure risk as standard deviation of returns or as the total risk. Therefore, these are the appropriate measures of portfolio evaluation, whereby the portfolio that you are evaluating comprises your total wealth or your overall wealth in that there is not further diversification. Train or measure and Jensen's alpha both measure risk as beta, which is un, which is just the systematic component of risk. Now, we might want to use systematic uh, risk where you've got a portfolio that is going to be further diversified, or it's a asset or a small portfolio that forms one part of a larger portfolio. The reason that we use beta in this case is because standard deviation would actually overestimate the effect of risk. Uh, because of the, the diversification that takes place when that portfolio forms part of the larger portfolio. So we use train or measure and Jensen's alpha when we've got an asset or a portfolio that's one part of our, of our bigger wealth portfolio. Information ratio, it's used to assess the performance of active fund managers. And the Sortino ratio and risk adjusted return on capital, that's used by an investor who takes downside risk into account in there as part of their utility function. So an investor who maybe treats up and downside risk differently, uh, this is a way that we can, we can capture that because it specifically focuses on the downside measure of risk rather than just measuring uh, total risk or beta, which are both symmetrical measures of risk. So that's our discussion of portfolio evaluation measures.